Hello. Okay, wonderful. Welcome, everyone. We're excited to all be here. So while we give everybody a chance to hop in, because I know people are probably back to back and all the things, um, would just love to see in this chat, like, where is everybody coming from? So just pop in the chat. Actually, yeah, Vanessa, you are always so great about working from all over the world. Where are you, where, where are you calling in from today? Um, I am in Mexico at the moment, uh, oh, okay. but I am heading back to Canada pretty soon for a pretty extended stay. So yes, but I, I'm in a random part again. I love it. Where in Mexico? In Tulum. In Tulum. Okay, beautiful. Melanie, are you in New York or where are you? No, I feel so pathetic. I'm just oh. in Jersey, man. I'm in oh, the army. You know, of hey. No, I actually, so I actually good. really, I actually really love Jersey. I, I'm always telling people like, you need to come. We get the most beautiful view of New York City. If you like New York City, come to New Jersey so you can see it from a better vantage point. You know, love it. Amazing. Well, I think it's just on my list just to come visit you and see it. Come visit we also me, have Rochelle. We've we've got some other people in New Jersey. Nice. Uh, looks like if we are chat, maybe um, seems like people are putting things in the Q and A as opposed to the chat. Um, maybe we're having a chat challenge. It, it is possible because um, Lindsay, I don't yeah. have access to message everybody. Neither do I. Okay, yeah. could be a settings all thing. All right, we'll do. We'll do. Um, okay, so Q and A. It is. It's all good. Um, okay, great. Well, lovely. It's well, going well, in the Q and A. I love that. Yeah, we're going Q&A style. Okay. Um, all right, great. Ooh, we've got someone from Ottawa. There we go. Love it. Um, okay, great. So um, thank you so much for coming. We're so delighted you're here. And I just wanna thank Vanessa and Melanie for joining us today. Um, this topic is near and dear to my heart. I, uh, my name is Lindsay Niels. I am the co-founder of Elevate Leadership. And building training that works and doesn't break the bank is a deep passion of mine and really sort of why I co-founded Elevate Leadership, because um, I really deeply believe that who you work for is everything and that management is 100% learned. It's not rocket science. It's doing the small things well and doing them consistently. And prior to founding Elevate, I was an executive at Fortune 50 companies and ran turnarounds and scaled teams and helped sell companies. And just over and over, I just saw like rep after rep, you see the impact a manager has. And we certainly all have our own personal stories. So um, I'm just delighted to have Vanessa and Melanie here. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves, but to kick it off, Vanessa is the VP of um, Culture and People at Policy Me. She is an expert at developing, creating culture, and also leading and um, delivering leadership development programs. She helped increase her manager's ability to have the tough conversations by 22%. So hats off to Vanessa. Also, um, you need to, um, if you don't have life insurance, Policy makes it easy, Policy Me, so check it out. Um, and also Policy Me is hiring and they really have an amazing culture. So I encourage you to check those out. So Vanessa, I'll hand it to you. Let me know what I missed. Yeah, that's a great intro, Lindsay. Um, and I will say, you know, a little bit biased and interested in sharing more a little bit later on, but we were able to do that with your help, which was great. And that's in that uh, improvement in terms of the tough conversations and so many interesting things that we worked on together. So uh, really looking forward to sharing more and how we did that. Uh, yeah, maybe just a couple of things I would add. Uh, we are a Toronto-based company. So for those that are in Canada, if you have any friends, acquaintances, family, anyone that's great and looking for a job, we're growing quite quickly at the moment. We have a lot of openings and more coming. So please check out our careers page. And in terms of a, a little sneak peek into our culture, we really are a place where we focus on giving people the ownership to actually deliver on their work. We really do live and breathe that every day. And I really do focus on building environments where people do enjoy coming into work every day. And a big part of that is helping people upskill and get the skills that they need to, to do their job. So I'm excited to, to share a little bit more about how we've done that, both from you know the, the leadership side of things, also skill-based learning uh, from a content perspective for different roles too. Amazing. Thank you, Vanessa. Appreciate it. And it looks like the chat is working now. So we even have someone from Spain. It's like happy hour in Spain. That's so kind of you to join us. I love it. Um, very fun. And look, a little Texas representation. Awesome. So Melanie, calling in from, from Jersey, um, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Melanie is VP of People at Athena. If you don't, 
if you have not heard of Athena, you should have heard of Athena. They're amazing. Um, also, Melanie not only will have so much wisdom from her role as VP of people at a very fast growing company, but they run compliance training that people actually love. And so um, she's going to have so many great tips for us to really how to make something engaging, how to get people to show up. So really excited to have Melanie on board with us. So um, Melanie, what else would you like to add? Well, I always feel like I have to uh, give some sort of disclaimer or something when, when people talk about compliance training because, because they always think we're lying. Like, what do you mean compliance training that people love? Uh, I'll say, listen, okay, listen, listen, listen. Athena literally made me leave my last job because of how much I love the training. I'll give you an example. They sent me, they were so smart. They sent me a sample and it was literally a comic strip of a queer uh, Hispanic woman and it, it was a day in the life and like that qualifies for um, the gender piece, the component that you have to educate people on. And it was just like the wildest, close experience. So anyway, when when Lindsay says that it's training that people actually like and it's compliance training that people actually like, like that's what we're talking about. I promise it's actually good stuff. Um, in terms of me, honestly, I think the only important note that you left out, Lindsay, is yeah. that I am a pet hoarder. And I have um, at any point in my life up to five animals in the home. It's truly problematic. I don't know what's wrong with me, but I can't I can't let them go. So so other than that, I think you got it spot on, Lindsay. Well, I'm glad I'm glad you covered that detail. We'd want to leave that out. That's amazing. Um, great. So um, real quick to kick this off, we are a remote team. Vanessa, I know you have a remote team too. There's probably lots of people out there. And so every team meeting, we do an icebreaker. And so, you know, I'm going to pretend this is our team meeting. So if you had to, and please put this in the chat too, for anyone who wants to contribute, if you had to wear one t-shirt every single day for an entire year, what would your t-shirt say? Okay, can I go first? Because I feel like Vanessa's going to have a really good one and I don't want to have to follow it. Hey, you know, I have a feeling yours is going to be much better no. considering <laughs> right before we started this, you knew what the question was in advance. And I'm like, I have no idea what this is. Hear me out, hear me out. Okay, I was thinking originally, I was like, oh, I should go like a really deep, meaningful like message that really like is going to change people's lives. And I was like, but is that true to me? Like, is that actually what I would wear? Truly not. I think if it was if if I was gonna wear a shirt every day for a year, it would literally say, "Can I pet your dog?" Um, and I would just go around petting everyone's dogs, and people who don't want me petting their dogs would be like, "No, thank you. No, thank you. This is a service dog. Please don't touch." So you know, I think, "Can I pet your dog?" would be my shirt. Okay, I love that. And for context, Mel, I wear that. Also, mine is not any better, just slightly different. Um, when we were chatting about this right before. Um, and also love seeing all the comments that are coming know, through the so chat. Funny. These are hilarious. Um, mine would say this is super cheesy and I'm sure this t-shirt already exists. Although Mel, I literally think I've seen it. Can I pet your dog t-shirt? So I think you're onto something. Um, mine would say you're enough. I feel like for anyone having a hard day, if you walk around, like it's just that little moment of like, right, I am enough. And sometimes all you need is to see it, that visual reminder. And I'm just like, the number of people that would just probably get a tiny little benefit would be large. So that probably would be mine. Love that. Love that so much. And I hope you guys are looking at the chat box because this is amazing. Not Amy, not annoyed, just need Botox. That's incredible. Mindfulness. Oh, this is so good. Um, an image of a bike made out of veggies and fruit. Nice. I love this. This is so good. Lots of lots of kindness. You can. Oh, I love that. That's nice. Awesome. Love it. These are great. Thank you for sharing. Okay. So we want to make sure this is as meaningful as possible for everyone who's joined us. So I'm going to do a quick poll and it is literally just like, let's see who's with us, not only where you live, but just like, what is your role? So I'm going to pop that up right now. And I just am so curious to see who is with us um, today. So if you can just pop your, um, what your role is, that would be awesome. Okay, great. I'm seeing them come in. This is exciting. Ooh, we've got a lot of learning and development. Makes sense. Um, excellent. They're coming in. I know the suspense is killing you guys, but um, okay, great. Awesome. Got a lot of HR here, which is also awesome. Excellent. Okay. And a lot of HR of team of one. Okay. I'm going to end this just so we can share this. Um, here we go. Okay, 
So as we can see, we have about nearly half the audience here is in HR or talent. Um, so excellent. We'll make sure this is meaningful for you. And we've also got a good, like good section of L and D, um, as well as some people who are just a team of one, which more power to you. We will definitely make this practical for you. And I also want to shout out, like, that's awesome that we have a lot of people who are not necessarily in the people function, because I would say this is just as much your sort of role, if you will, to set people up for success as it is the people role. So awesome. Thank you for coming. Um, okay. Great. Um, all right. So when we think about, I'd love to hear your experience. And like, when you think about how do you really set up a program from success from like the beginning, like just thinking about it, thinking about what you need to even train on to, to the end, like how do you even define the end? Right. But like how, I just would love if you can share sort of like, what's your recipe? Like, how should people be thinking about this? Vanessa, do you want to kick us off? Yes, sorry. The unmute thing. It's so funny. We're so many years into this now, but the seconds that it takes to go hit it every time. Um, yeah, of course, Lindsay, happy to kick it off. You know, I think when it comes to setting up training programs for success, and I left some notes on the side. So if you see me looking, I just want to make sure I give you guys the best examples. Um, I think that there's first that thinking of what is it that you're trying to solve for, right? So I think to get clear on where is the gap? What do people need to learn? Why? Why does this matter to the business, right? I think, and we'll, we'll talk about business strategies a little bit later, but I think the best way to get alignment and buy in for these things, which often do require a little bit of a budget, is if they're actually solving a problem. I think where I've seen training programs go wrong from the beginning is someone says, oh, I think we should just have this kind of training. And sure, there's endless amounts of training that seem great. And if there was unlimited time and money, we could do all of them, but there isn't. So I always say, start with like, what is the problem you're solving? And ideally have that be a problem that's been brought up by the CEO or by someone on the executive team, like something that's really impacting the ability for the business to do X, Y, or Z. So um, I'll give you two examples of essentially two that came my way, which were very, very different. So one was, you know, as you said at the beginning, Lindsay, we're in the insurance industry. It is not an easy industry to understand. A lot of the times people join with experience in startups or their field, but they've never worked in insurance before. So if you are new to the insurance space, it can be a lot to take in, right? And you know, you can Google chat GPT, whatever it might be, but it's like, are you learning what you need to know for this company, for this job? So the, our problem was people coming in and them just not fully understanding the industry we were operating in and the way we needed it to. So, we created something internal for that, which was a series of sessions of intro to insurance, intro to the different types of products that was actually company wide sessions. And then we recorded those so they were made available to new hires when they onboarded if they were coming at a later date and had not been there for that training. So that is one example of like we figured out that there was an industry knowledge problem. We figured out it doesn't really make sense to have a partner come in because it's very specific to us and how we operate within the, this industry and how this industry works. So we created it. A totally different example, which Lindsay, I know you're familiar with, was you know, a policy we were growing startup, right? And we try to promote from within as much as we can. We run a quarterly engagement survey and we noticed that our newly promoted managers were actually getting, just honestly to be direct, pretty bad scores from their direct reports in comparison to our more experienced managers, like this is no surprise, right? You make someone into a new manager, you give them no training, like they're not gonna succeed, unless maybe they're just like naturally the best manager. Once in a while you get one of those, but it's more rare. So with that, it quickly became a problem that for us to be able to promote people from within and to give people these career paths they were looking for, we needed to upskill them, right? And the answer wasn't like, oh, we need to hire experienced managers from the side. It was like, how do we build up the leadership skills that these managers need to essentially be able to do their jobs. And this became a problem at the executive level, right? Because we were like, okay, we need to do this in order for our teams to work well and for us to be able to deliver on our business priorities. So um, on that note, I, I know you know the rest of the story, but for, for that process, it was different. And something that I always follow when I'm looking for external training support is to reach out to my network of HR peers or post on LinkedIn, just say, I'm looking to do X, this is my goal. Do you know anyone that does this type of training or have you used anyone? 
And for me, I always try to collect that information first, see what other people are saying, see what's worked, see what hasn't worked. I always, um, if you're ever looking to do that type of research and ask people to give you their thoughts, I always say, I will compile it and share it back with you too. So that's something that I always do, which lands quite well, because then all of my findings, I put them together, I send it back to anyone who has kind of helped me collect that information. And uh, in that secondary example of just, you know, how do we upskill the managers is, you know, we ended up partnering together to do this. So I am sure we can share a little bit more, but I think when it comes to like that original setup for success, just to bring it back, it's really, what are you trying to solve for? Does it make sense in house? If yes, follow that path. If not, and you need to find a partner, how do you find that best partner for you? And usually it's, you know, asking your network, figuring out what's worked and what hasn't. And I always say, think about what you can give back to those people that you're asking for their help. Love that. Super helpful. Uh, Melanie, what are your thoughts on this question? Yeah, I have I have two takes. One is maybe a hot take. I don't know. Am yeah, I saying right. yeah, it's so you're it. <laughs> That's a hot take. I think so. Oh, my first one, hopefully I don't forget the second by the time I finish talking about the first. I think, listen, uh, we're all HR professionals in here for the most part, whether you're an L and D or straight talent or HR, right? We're in we're in that umbrella. And I think that we have a tendency um sometimes to want to, and I fall under this bucket, right? Um, to want to uh sort of like optimize for perfection before we roll something out, uh, rather than iteration. And I wanna I wanna have empathy here before I go on and say that like there's a reason we're like that it's because we're so closely scrutinized because people don't take us seriously because people think of us as not revenue producing we're just administrative and so our reaction understandably is we need to work twice as hard as any other department to prove our value and put out the most perfect thing and we can't have any sort of flaw within the thing that we put out there and I would argue that we are shooting ourselves in the foot when we do that and so my hot take is I think that to actually roll out a successful um, training program especially one for managers it's not to try and and perfect this entire um, course catalog before you start, I actually would start with a baby thing. So to to, um, Vanessa's point, find find a point that you know is a problem and solve that, but don't plan out the whole series. Plan your first training and then use that as an experiment to then collect data and determine what's the next training that we have to get or what that we need to roll out. What's the biggest thing that we're identifying? What are what are all the managers saying during these inter- during these trainings? Like that that then that data will then help inform the future trainings you do. So I think the first thing um, to ensure, in my opinion, a really successful training program is don't plan out the whole thing before you've started. Plan a small piece and then iterate over time. Show your managers that you are listening, that you care, that you will adjust and accommodate as long as they give as well, right? The second thing is hopefully less of a hot take, but I don't know. Nobody wants to be talked at for an hour. Even in this webinar, Lindsay, you were being so thoughtful as to incorporate polls, as to incorporate these icebreaker questions interacting with the audience in the comments. I think that another area where we tend to go wrong is we're trying to solve all these problems. So what do we do? We pack everything in. We put, we create a a nine page manager handbook. This deck is going to be 50 slides long. And I'm going to tell you every single thing you ever needed to know about managing. I actually think that is the wrong approach. I think um, more effect, more effective and more important is small, but memorable. So for example, you know, um, our managers at Athena uh, for performance management, we don't give them sort of like a, a nine box rubric of all the things to measure performance. We have three questions. It's um, what I, if this person were to quit today, um, would I feel relieved or panicked? If I could go back in time knowing what I know today, um, would I still hire this person? And ultimately, are they making my job easier or harder? And we framed an entire training around just those three questions because the point was to get managers really comfortable asking these things and remember it. We want them to walk away and remember these things. If you pack too much of a punch, they're not gonna, it's, it's a lot of information and no one's gonna remember it. So, so I say all that to say, my, my second point is actually, I think that most people get the balance of trainings wrong. I think they do like, like 95% content, 5% Q&A at the end. I actually think, I mean, give or take, I don't know, don't 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 quote me on these percentages, but I think it should be roughly um 20% content uh, uh about maybe like let's say 40% um discussion interactive 
And then 40% actually practicing the thing that you are doing, which we can talk about some more. And I will say sneaky, this isn't a percentage, but you're doing this in the background. You're collecting data as you do all of that, because the way that your managers respond, the questions that they go, ooh, that they have, the, it, the problems that they bring to the table, the responses that they have to the tips that you give them, that is informative data that will tell you, okay, we need to lean in more here. Like, oh, I didn't realize all those problems were going on, right? And the reason why the, the communication piece is so, so critical is because what you're really doing with that communication um, is building community. Because really what managers want with these sessions is to have someone to lean on, to know that they're not alone. Half of it is imposter syndrome. And so really what you want to do is like, there's a little bit of content, right? Because like you need that thing. But really what you want to do is make people feel comfortable, build psychological safety, understand what's going on and make them start to lean on each other. So, so those are my, you know, two sort of like areas of focus when it comes to building out um, a successful uh, training program. Lindsay, I love that. Can I add a couple of things? Yeah, because please. Obviously when Mel says things, I think of more things. Um, so I think what Mel was saying at the first point and then the second point as well, but the first point on the iteration, it's so key. One of the things that I did is basically, Mel, very similar to what you're describing. I set out the first two sessions and I was like, these are the first two based on business need for continuing leadership training for our manager cohort that went through last year, our executive cohort. And then I said, and these are the four that I'm thinking we may wanna do. However, these are not set in stone. So after we start going through number one, number two, let's really think about what are the topics that we need to cover as a business? Like what's most important to you? What's gonna get you excited to actually come and discuss and what is gonna be meaningful to you? Because I also think a lot of the times we can set like an annual training program. And especially if you work in a startup, so much can change in six months that by the time you get to that training five, maybe that's not even important or there's something that's so much more important that's a better use of your time and of the time that people are joining. So I think I, I love that point and iteration. I share also that example of like the tentative ones that you might do. I do have some people within the business that like, if I just give them one or two, they'd be like, but what's coming next? So it's like, here's my like tentative preview that could totally change. But I do think being iterative and like taking that feedback is so, so key. Um, and I loved what you were saying about the interactive component, Mel, as well. One of the things that we always do is like when we're learning, we always have discussion moments or little exercises as we go through it and pause. And it's so funny because every time that I put people into breakout groups and then they come back. So before they go into the breakout groups, most cameras are on because we're like a pretty camera on company, but like 80% I'd say. And then everyone's just like, this is the faces. And then after the breakout groups, 100% of cameras are on when they come back. Everyone's laughing, smiling, total face change. And like people are way more engaged. And I think sometimes to your point, like we not only leave like a Q&A to the end, but like groups to the end. I always say like, try to do it as quickly as you can in it. And then you can go back into the big room, but that's what's gonna keep people more engaged. And I think that like one-on-one -on -one connection or like that three to one or like the smaller group settings then gives people more of that accountability because then if they're going back into their group again, they don't wanna let their group down, you know, they wanna listen, they wanna come in with the good ideas and to share the discussion. So I think it's just like that iterative process as well of getting people through the whole training in a more engaged way. Love that. I love that. Yeah. So just to summarize, I'm hearing, um, just really make sure that you're always like, what problem are we solving? Right? Like what, what, why are we doing this? Cause it's so important. I think for people to also know, like, why am I here? Why do I need this? Right. And making sure that links to the business. And then Mel, and I love your perspective about like, and, and Kay in the chat, just like, I thought she distilled this so well, or he or they is love this iterative approach, small and memorable versus big and perfect, like brilliant. Love that. Um, and yeah, unfortunately, we forget information so easily. And so how do we make sure it's really relevant and recognizing, Vanessa, as you just said, that things change, right? And so planning an entire thing out is like, no one does that also. Like, think about product, right? Think about it, you're constantly iterating, you're getting feedback. Um, and so, you know, um, challenging us all to like have that same, you know, mentality to it and have the confidence to do that. Love that. Wonderful. Well, I'd, I'd love to hear from the audience, like what challenges are you facing? And um, and let's see how we can help help you out. So I'm going to launch a poll. So I'm very curious to see like what, what challenges as you think about running your own training programs are you facing right now? So I've launched it here. So if you want to pop your answer in there, is it the creating of the content, recruiting people to show up and keeping them engaged, like keeping them coming, ensuring the learning stick, 
Is it about proving ROI? Great question. Finding budget? Can you even get off the ground? Or something else? And if there's something else that isn't on this list, just pop it into the chat and we'll uh, we'll check it out and try to help you out. It's so fun waiting for the answers to come. I know out. it's so fun. It's so fun. I, love it. I feel like type A me right away was like, oh, I want to vote. And then there's a little disclaimer that says hosts and panelists cannot vote. And I was like, all right, just wait for the answers. <laughs> oh, this is great. Okay. A few more coming in. So I'll give people a few more minutes. Love it. Okay. All right. Get your pop your answers in there. And without further ado, here we go. Okay. So two thirds, nearly the biggest challenge they're facing is ensuring the learnings are implemented, right? Because we're often, we're trying to create behavior. We're not just learning for learning's sake. So how do you make sure that the learnings are actually implemented and they stick after the end of the program? So that was the number one. So let's tackle that first. So what, any tips, Vanessa or Melanie, whoever wants to jump in first, how do we make it sticky? How do we get people to actually implement the learning? Sure. Um, I guess the first two things that come to mind are one we already covered, right? Make it make it memorable, which means keep it short. And uh, and it is so hard because as an HR professional, as HR professionals, we know so much. We have so much wisdom to share. So we're trying to like share it all, but but we can't because we need to think about what is the actual impact of what I'm going to do. The more information you share, like please remember this: the more information you share, the less information will be retained. And so you really need to distill it to like truly no more than two to three things that you want people to walk away from a training remembering and stick to it. If you can think of alliterations, if you can keep it pithy, so it's like a three word thing, it, like those three questions, like what, like whatever you can do to make it brief and memorable. Um, the second thing is to put it into practice, um, show that it actually works. If you tell people a cool thing and then you say, okay, go forth and conquer, people are going to forget about it. People learn through storytelling. People learn through doing. And so if you can tell a good story, whether that's through providing a scenario that people respond to or having managers speak up about this thing and sharing their own stories, and then they get to practice together as they're like trying to apply the learnings that they're going to remember that because like you can literally look this up adults learn through storytelling and so uh whatever you can do to get people talking and sharing their own stories while they're practicing the information you're giving them the more likely they are to remember and retain that information yeah i i love that and i think Lindsay did take a step back with that question. I think sometimes I get that question from our founders or the rest of the executive team. Yeah. It's like, how do we know if the training worked? Right. Mm -hmm. And I think it's like beyond like our people doing the thing. We're not sitting in with people in their one on ones. We're not sitting in when managers are delivering feedback every time. We're not sitting in to essentially shadow someone for like their entire week. And especially we're remote. Right. So it's sometimes the question of um, was this even worth people's time? And I think that's where um, you know, I loved what Mo was saying to help make sure that it sticks. I think you do need to find some type of measurement component, which is like a pre and a post and just like keep at it and check to see what's going on. So if you're doing some, you know, I know there's lots of perspectives on surveys. Yes, nay, whatever it might be that yours is. But like, I do think if you're going to run something and you're going to want to check one, did it work? And two, is it continuing to hold or did it fall apart? You need to be measuring something. And I think in HR, it's so, so important to, to be numbers driven. So for me, for example, it was, you know, when we promoted those managers internally, I could see that their scores were lower than the average manager in terms of, you know, a number of factors that direct reports were essentially mentioning about their managers. And after we went through trainings, those scores did go up across a number of areas, but I monitor it over time too. And basically, if there's any particular area that I see that's dropping, it's like, okay, let's dig deeper. Like what part of the business is struggling with that? What's going on in that part of the business? What else do they need? How do we reinforce? Is it actually just like reaching out to some of those managers in that part of the business and being like, hey, I noticed, you know, employees in this part of the business are feeling like they're not getting enough feedback anymore. And they were a couple of months ago. Like, have you noticed anything's changed? And a lot of the times I'll say, you know, oh, we just got super busy. We couldn't figure out how to fit it in anymore. So that's where you need to think about, okay, what training did you provide? Why was it working? Why did it stop working? And how do you need to do reinforcement in a way that's actually effective? So to Mel's point, it's like, what are the couple things that you're going to want them to remember again? 
And how do you essentially reinforce that in a way that creates that sustainability? And it's hard. Like I deal with this all the time. Sometimes these things come up and I'm like, okay, I have no idea how I'm going to get these people to feel like feedback is important. And then I take that step back. You think about the whole thing again. You think about why it worked the first time. You think about the learnings you have, how you're going to implement it again. And it's just really breaking it down to like, what's actually holding, what's not holding, and how do you actually address the areas that you need to? I'm going to um, briefly add just one more thing, because I always like to make sure with any question I answer that I'm providing actual, like tactical things that you could take away today. Um, I will say that as we're doing all of these things, one of the things that we really need to remember is you know, we meet, we need to meet managers halfway, which means that we need to do our part of supporting building this into the culture and normalizing it. And so I'll give you two things that you could do today. Um, if you want to show your managers that you are here to partner with them on making these things um, uh, part of your culture. Um, one, at Athena, we do this thing called Feedback Fridays. Um, it's not optional. It's every other Friday, managers and direct reports are required to meet with each other and share feedback on three things. Um, what could I be doing better? What could you be doing better? And what could the company be doing better? And then also the reverse, right? What, is, what am I doing well? What are you doing well? What, could the what is the company doing well? And the way that we partner is that it's literally scheduled as new hires start. We put it on their calendar. It's not a thing where it's like, maybe do it. It's optional. Hopefully people do it. No, it's it's part of the culture. It is every Friday. We know that managers and direct reports, it's dedicated to giving each other feedback. Um, the other thing is we want managers to do EQ check-ins. It's We understand that managers are busy and they will forget. And what happens in a one-on-one, -on -one, you fall into just status check mode, right? Like what's status update on this, this, this. Um, we actually have a manager Slack channel and we just schedule at the start of every quarter, um, I just I, I put them all in. I schedule it, and every other Friday, um, because of those feedback Fridays, right? That's a great time to ask that question to kick off the feedback Friday conversation. I feed them a question to ask. So one to five, uh, how motivated are you when you log into work every day? Um, uh, you know, um, what's one thing I could be doing better as your manager to partner with you, right? And so the manager doesn't have to lose time trying to figure out what's a good question to ask. I am giving them the question. I'm not forcing them to do it, right? But I'm giving them the tool to succeed and I'm making it easy on myself by just doing it. I spend 10 minutes at the beginning of a quarter, I schedule them all out and they have it there for the rest of the quarter. And so I say that to say, you know, um, I think sometimes we just want to like force managers, like do the thing, but if we're not supporting and empowering them in doing that and showing them that we're willing to put in the effort too, it can quickly fall apart. Um, by the way, if anybody wants um, a list of those questions, uh, just hit me up. I can share them with you. Um, I'm very happy happy to, to share the information. Thank you, Melanie. I love it. So a theme that I'm hearing coming out is in terms of really, how do you, how do you make these stick? It's about making it part of the culture, right? And so whether it's like, you know, the way I think about it too, and you're bringing up great examples, Melanie, of like, how can you really bring these things up into the way people are already working? Like they're having one-on-one. -on -one, so then how do you create that in the one-on-one -on -one environment? Or how do you, how do you create opportunities you put on the work schedule, but everybody does it, right? So it's like building these social norms around these behaviors that you know will make everybody successful, right? Like giving feedback. Um, I love that, Vanessa. I feel like you've also done a really um, nice job that you might want to share in terms of like, you've, you've built these communities and the way they often like interact sometimes because they're remote is on Slack, but you have like manager communities and you're often, I see you in there and like, you're like popping like, here's a tip on this, or here's like the one pager on the class we ran, just to make sure that like, you know, you're trying to meet them where they are and just keeping it front of mind. You want to share a little bit about like how you've cultivated that? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, it goes back to what Mel was saying. It's like resources that are actually helpful. And I think one of the things that I do as well, um, I think sometimes, especially as we're growing, we forget that so much of this, there's value in that one-on-one -on -one connection, even between me as the person overseeing the people side of things and like any manager that just wants to have a chat. So I very much have like my virtual open door policy. There's a few managers that I do regular coaching sessions with that we have scheduled and they're like an optional thing too. Like we put them in the calendar and it's like, if you need it, we keep it. If you don't just tell me and you can have your time back. And it's these like no commitment sessions that we have on the calendar, not to say they're not important, but they really are meant as a space for them. Right. So what I say is like, if there's nothing that you want to discuss today, no problem. Like, let's skip it. These are here for you. And then sometimes it's the opposite. Someone will reach out and we'll say, Hey, no, we're not meant to chat for another two weeks, but I had this thing come up. Like, can we chat this week? And I'm like, of course, no problem. 
And I think part of that is like that culture of support, but to meet someone where they're at, instead of getting them potentially to do all of these different things that may not be exactly what they're looking for. Um, specifically, Lindsay, to what you were getting at with the, with the communities. So one of the things that we did when we went forward and launched Elevate was so much of it is, you know, Lindsay and Lucy give me incredible content, but I'm running it in house, right? So, so much of it is like, how do we actually do it for us? How do we engage with it? How do we make it so that it's going to be impactful? And we do have different like Slack private communities that, you know, one is for our manager cohort, another is for our executive cohort. We're about to launch the second manager cohort because we had more manager promotes, more manager hires. And now we're going to kick off the next one um, in a few weeks. And it's a space for them to also share resources like one of the really cool things that happened last year when we were going through through the program was we had someone say, oh, I did this. You know, they were um, in the design space and they did a course, which was super helpful for them around design. And they had gotten this like really interesting template around how to think through your strengths. And they really liked it. And they talked about it during our training and then they shared it in the community for everyone else to also be able to use and look at the resource. So I think part of it is like creating a space where um, I think sometimes, and I don't know if you experience this too, but sometimes what can feel hard is like, I'm the HR person, therefore I'm the one that has to give the content. And it's like this blocker of like, but so many people have great stories and great content and other things that they've done and learned over the years. And I think so much is like breaking that barrier of like, hey, I am here to create the container, to create that space. I'll give you all of my knowledge and wisdom, but please like, let's not forget you also have knowledge and wisdom. And like, this is a space where you can also share your knowledge and wisdom. And sure, maybe once in a while someone shares something that I'm like, well, maybe not the best resource, but like you talk about it, you like actually can go through like, okay, maybe why this is not as helpful here. But I find like 95% of the time people will share awesome things that help curate and create that community of learning. And to the point that we've already said, right? People just wanna connect with each other. So whomever shared that new resource is now the contact for when someone else is gonna try and use it. And to me, the more you can co-develop and co-create with the people in your organization, the less it becomes like HR is telling me to do training. And the more it becomes, I am part of this, this is my learning, I own it, and people are actually engaged. Awesome, thank you. And just so you can see in chat, Melody did really kindly share that Friday feedback template. It looks like there's a few questions, Melody, about how much time do you normally block out? Like how long do you leave for feedback Friday? 15, yeah. 30 minutes, how long is so that? It's a great question in particular because I do want to emphasize this. In order for initiatives like this to be successful, in my opinion, it's important not to be overly prescriptive. Like it's important to be flexible and let people um, do it in the ways that work best for them. We have some managers who do it every Friday. We have some managers who are like, quite frankly, I don't need it every Friday. We're going to do it every other Friday. We have some managers who say, do you know what? Every other Friday... I'll be the one giving feedback and the other person's just listening. And then we alternate who gives feedback every other week. So really they're, they're giving feedback once a month, but the other person, so then twice a month, they are chatting about feedback. So it's really up to you all to decide what is best for you all. I think what's best is to empower people with resources versus the, um, like with the what. I, I don't think the how is as important as long as it works for them and you are clear on what the outcome, the desired outcome is. Um, like that's the most important thing to emphasize. But if you want to do it for 15 minutes, great. You want to do it for 30 minutes, also great. You want to do it alternating Fridays, you do you. Um, I saw that, yeah, there was a, a point about like a manager who has too many direct reports. Maybe they, again, they cascade it. So like you are the first Friday of every month. You are the second Friday of every month. Whatever works best for you. Nice. Thank you. Great. Well, one one other um, challenge that a third of the people felt like um, was a challenge was proving ROI. So I thought I'd launch another poll really about which is connected to ROI and I'm curious to see here, like, what is the biggest peop challenge people have with collect with uh, with seeking budget? Because that's certainly connected to ROI, so we can also address that. So, I'm going to launch a poll right now, and this is all about like, what is the biggest challenge that people face with getting budget? And we'll see what comes in. So, it's about proving ROI or measuring how employees put their learnings into practice about influence with finance, like building that relationship and being able to speak their language. Also just like hearing we have no budget and then what do you do? <laughs> that certainly happens, right? Awesome, we're coming in. Ooh, this is like neck and neck. 
Which two, which two? Which two, which two, I know. Okay, I'm gonna share. All right, get your last final final ones in there. Um, okay, here we go. So we have, dun, 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 dun. okay, it looks like nearly half, well, yeah, quite a distribution here. Okay, so proving ROI and business impact is these challenges. So let's definitely tackle that. And hearing we have no budget, like what do you do then? Now maybe we can, we can give some creative strategies and measuring how employees put their learnings into practice. That feels related to number one as well. So let's tackle this one. What are your thoughts on like, how do you prove the ROI and the business impact? Any thoughts on that? First. What's that? I, yeah. I, oh, sorry, oh, no, go. no, no, you go. I, I mean, I'll throw in and say that I think, uh, I think where most people go wrong is they start by trying to prove a point before they've even collected the data. And, and the second piece where people go wrong is once they make an argument and their argument gets vetoed, that's just the end of the discussion. Here's what I mean by that. I think that before you try to make any argument, you need to make sure that you even understand what your CEO and leadership team is prioritizing for. Um, questions like, what are your top three priorities uh, this this quarter? Um, what are your biggest headaches that, you, that you're trying to get rid of? Because once you know that, then you can build an effective argument for how the thing that you want to do is going to help solve their problem, is going to help work towards their priorities. The second thing is um, when you get a no, don't just let that be the end of the conversation. I hear this so often. So people will go to their you know, CEO, they say, we need manager training, morale is low. And the, and the CEO is like, yeah, it's not my problem. We got other problems right now, right? You're going to get a no. And then the conversation's over. It's sort of like, oh gosh, the CEO doesn't care. Really what's happening is a couple of things. One, you probably didn't use business terms that matter to the CEO. So instead of saying employee morale is low, which to us means, you know, we understand when morale is low, that means productivity goes, that means, you know, productivity goes down. That means our ARR goes down. Like we understand those things because we're in the people world, but a CEO hears morale is down and they think, oh, you're just here to be like the like the happy committee. You know what I mean? Um, so so one is making making sure you're using the the right business terms. But second of all, if they say no, follow up with really um, thoughtful questions. Okay, why is this a no? What about this is causing you the most c concern? Because maybe they answer you and it's it's time. I don't have enough time. You can't take an hour of all of my manager's time. Okay, so why don't we replace and not add? That's a very that's a very easy solution or problem to handle. So instead of adding time to every manager's calendar, what we're going to do is the next all hands, if we can partner together, we're going to cancel all hands and we will use all hands time for the manager training. I haven't had it added any time to any managers or, hey, I'm going to get asked Ask all the managers to cancel their feedback Friday this the next two weeks and there we go we give them that exact same time right if they say budget is the problem well it's too much money okay this is a this is a tricky one where I think people um they they really like it's it's a missed opportunity if anytime your CEO says no it's money follow up with okay what dollar amount would I have to get to for you to okay this because now you have to now they're putting on their strategic thinking like oh crap maybe it's not really money I just don't buy into this so now we're gonna have to have a bigger discussion maybe it is money and all I had to do was cut the spend by 5k I can do that I can make that work right maybe it's you know I need it to be free until I can see the ROI and then I will start investing in some money right there are all these um I can also share Bob position I'm very big on like how to talk to CEOs and leadership teams I think understanding CEO speak is so critical to the success of any people leader. Um, but anyway, uh, like so, so critical. So th those are my two things is make sure you collect the data before you pose any argument and make sure that if you get a no, you are well prepared to follow up with thoughtful questions that will get you to next steps versus, oh, well, it's a no. And now the conversation's over and I didn't collect any data from that discussion. Super helpful. Um, can I just say, I love these. And Mel, I do the exact same thing in terms of the questions. Um, I think that one of the things that I found, especially like I, if there was like a, yay, and just repeat what you've said, I would for so much of it. I think part of it is with that CEO or the executive team, like I couldn't agree more. It's so important to speak about it in business terms. I do think what happens sometimes is like, we come to the table with ideas that aren't quantified yet. So like, I think the worst thing that can happen is to ask them, well, what dollar value would be acceptable? Or like, what, if I could get this down to X, would you say yes? And, but you not knowing what X actually is that's workable. So I think it's so important to come to the table also with that research and with those options so that you can prefer, you can 
present your preferred choice, but maybe that one's too expensive, but you're like, okay, here's different ways that we can look at the budget, or here's different ways that I can negotiate next steps, or having had those conversations already in advance with potential partners to understand and have that information at the table with the CEO. So like you are as prepared as possible. I will say this actually, um, as Mel was talking, brought up to me a very different scenario that I've been in, but just depending on the type of role I had in the business. So in case people are kind of experiencing this, I think there's two types of organizations. One that really values the people leader and they you have a seat at the table, right? So that is the organization where it's not only like CEO speak, executive team speak, like you're a part of that executive team, right? And what that means is you're working with these people regularly. You understand their needs. You understand the biggest challenges. So when you're proposing something, you come at it with a full understanding of what's going on in the business. And I do think, and you know, personally being in that role today, it is easier. I'm not gonna lie, like it is easier. If you're part of the team, that's gonna be the decision maker of whether we need something or not. And you clearly see, okay, you know, we're trying to increase partnerships in this way. And the issue that we're having is that we don't know how to do this thing. And here's how I think we can solve it. Awesome. Like they're gonna be like, okay, amazing. Yeah, like let's do this. Or, you know, you've said, three times in the last five leadership meetings that the biggest time sucker for you is like direct reports of managers that are coming to you directly because the managers are not doing this thing well. Like it's very easy when you're in the conversation. I think what's really hard, and I've been in this situation before at a prior organization where you're the person leading the people initiatives, where you're the one that has to come to the table with like all these amazing ideas for how we're gonna bring the business forward, but you don't have a seat at the leadership table and you're like working closely with the senior executives and like that's kind of what you would say when you're like next to them but not in there with them and from being in that situation it's very very challenging because you don't actually hear their problems directly so what you normally have is like an executive sponsor that you're reporting into that then tells you about their perspective of what's going on in those meetings so if you're in that situation, which in my opinion is harder because you don't actually hear everyone's concerns, you may not actually be reporting into the CEO. And therefore, when you're trying to bring something forward, the questions that you get may not be exactly what you expect. Um, in those scenarios, my best piece of feedback is like actually try to talk to each of those people that are on the executive team one on one and say, hey, I'm trying to understand how we can maximize learning in this organization. And I don't think I'm super clear as to what I could do to best support your team. Do you have 15 minutes? Do you have 30 minutes just to help me understand a little bit more about like the biggest challenges your team is facing? And like that way you're building a bit more of those relationships. And even if you're not on the executive team, like all of them with that type of questioning will give you 15 minutes. You can build a little bit more report. You can get a little bit closer. And what that does is not only will you have better information to just go to the table with, but next time they have a challenge, they're more likely to actually come to you than to just talk about it as a team. And one of the issues I had is I often felt that they were just like, they were in this like eco chamber of just like discussion about a problem without finding a solution. And by the time it came to me, I didn't even understand where it started. And it was like this really hard thing of like, what am I really solving? So I think if you're in that role, which is the HR leader that unfortunately does not yet have a seat at the table, really try to build those one-on-one -on -one relationships with the rest of the executive team, which will really help with that buy-in, even if you're not at the table every day. Awesome, thank you. Um, I wanna make sure we give the audience some, some opportunity to ask questions. So also real quick, I'm gonna launch one last poll and this is um, so that we don't spam you, but I wanna um, see if you wanna follow up at all. We actually, we built an ROI calculator and done a ton of research um, on this. So if we can be helpful at all, please just let us know. We will set up some time and we can walk you through that. And I think the same theme is coming up in terms of like, what problem are we solving, right? And sometimes you've gotta meet one-on-one -on -one to get to the heart of that. Um, but if you want to chat at all, we love being a thought partner. Um, and you know, whether it's about coaching or live workshops or elevate Academy or ROI calculators, you name it, uh, we're here for you. So just pop, Lindsay, pop that in there. Um, as they're doing that, can I just like yeah. give a quick shameless plug for you that you did not ask me to give? Um, I remember back to when I first met Lindsay and I'd spoken to all these different potential L and D partners, because at the time I was a team of one, I was trying to figure out how I was going to do this. LND takes a lot of time if you're building your own content. And what I loved was like, Lindsay was not trying to sell me on anything. She was like, okay, like, let's try to figure out like, what are you even looking to do here? And I think that was so helpful because to have someone in the space who 
who just took the time to sit with me and to think it through. I had 35 things going on at the same time. This was one on my many, on my list of many. And just like having that first conversation was actually super helpful. And I think also um, one thing that I think, Lindsay, you guys are really good at is just meeting people where they're at and from an HR leader perspective. And I, I say that because some of us want to run our own training. Some of us want you to come in and do the training. Some of us want to only it this particular way. And you're like, okay, we can do that. So I think what I loved is, um, and ultimately, like, again, they're not asking me to say this, but why I chose them as a partner was just like that flexibility of working with me in the way that I needed. So anyways, I think if you're curious, I definitely would say reach out to them. I've spoken to lots of people about my experience working with them and it truly has been great. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Um, I know I feel very, very fortunate. Um, okay. So let's, um, let's hear some questions from the audience. Um, I am also, as you can see, Vanessa and Melanie are wealth information. So while you pop questions into the Q and A, I'm also just going to share my screen here. Let me end this. Um, can you see this? Let's put it in play because they are incredible about contributing on LinkedIn too. And obviously I try to do my part too, but please um, follow them. Like they're so great about practical, actionable advice. Like they really contribute to the community. So please follow them. Also, um, I wanted to give you a gift because, you know, my mom always taught me that when you show up at someone's house, you give a gift. And I feel like we, you, you showed up to our meeting. So also if you want to check out Elevate Academy or anything like that, please, there's a free trial there. But let's get to let's get to some questions. Wanna wanna make sure we're helping you out here. Um, now, of course, this is up and I can't see the questions. Hold on. <laughs> okay. Well, all right. I can go. Yeah. Well, I can answer if if you're still opening because there's one that's directed at me. It's oh, just to perfect. quickly. Great. Thanks, Melanie. I appreciate that. Yeah. Of course. Um, so uh, Amy asked me to repeat the three prompts I use for manager performance assessment. Um, so it's if I um, if this person were to quit today, how would I feel? Relieved, uh, panicked, something else? If I could go back in time knowing what I know today, would I hire this person again? Um, and ultimately, is this person making my job easier or harder? And the reason why we worded it this way is because most times when you ask a manager, um, oh, is this person a high performer? Are they doing well? Um, immediately, uh, emotions take over. And so it's like, well, they're a really nice person or like, well, but they're, I can tell they're really trying hard or, well, but they kind of do this really well. And it, and it gets really complicated. And I think oftentimes we try to help by providing maybe too complex a rubric, like how, like measure one to five on these 20 things. Really what we want to understand is, is this person ultimately bringing value to the company? And if the answer is yes, then the answer to those questions is very simple. If the answer to those questions is blurry, then it means that they are not obviously uh, positively contributing to the company. And that's really, um, it doesn't mean that you need to immediately move to terminate the employee, but it does mean that clearly there's some work um, that you need to get done. Mel, Thanks. I ask the same question about the, if you go back in time, would you rehire this person? I just find that to be like the most impactful one. And I will say, um, if there's not a strong yes, if it's just like a soft yes, or like, the, you know, the because you kind of give people a, a level, I find we give four options to answer. And sometimes I feel like I should only give them two, like yes, no, or other. And if you hit other, tell me why. Um, but, you know, I think sometimes people have like those people that are amazing. So they're clear, strong, yes. And then some that are yes. I always just like follow up and I'm like, hey, I realize like, you know, maybe what does yes mean to you or what did strong yes mean to you or you know for that person you put no why like what's going on there and i think it's just such a good conversation starter to mel's point you don't have to go to terminate immediately of course but it's just like maybe they say oh they've just become so annoying with blah 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 and like someone just goes on a rant and you're like whoa did not realize that what's going on tell me more so i think um i think the best questions are the ones that lead to good discussion as a follow-up if um you need it so i think these are really really awesome the ones mel just shared Great. Thank you. Let's see if we can help Rachel out. So Rachel's saying, I still need more insight on how do you measure if the knowledge transferred post-training? Any thoughts on that? I really do use my engagement survey scores. Um, I will say uh, how I do mine. I do use CultureAmp and my engagement survey is lengthy. I know there's people that have, again, lots of opinions on these and we rethink about it as a business as well. But you know, I do actually have the specifics, right? So I have everything from like, are people feeling like they're getting enough feedback? Is their manager invested in like their career path? Like all of those questions I actually ask once a quarter. Um, 
And because I have that level of detail, I can tell when things are shifting. So for me, I love it because it helps me answer these questions that otherwise can be really, really tough. But Mel, I don't know if you are doing it differently. I don't know that I'm, at, I'm doing differently. I would say that one thing I would add to that is I think when it comes to management training, people often forget the direct report component of this. So it's like all focused on the manager and like, how do we train the manager? But where we, I think, lose focus sometimes is don't forget about the managing up piece and the transparency piece. And so like one, yes, of course, train your direct reports on how to manage up. But two, you know, one of the things that maybe a hot take, I don't know, I know some people feel uncomfortable doing this. All of our training decks for managers, they're publicly available to all of our employees so that they can see exactly the standards that we hold our managers accountable to at our all hands. We are communicating when we're doing our manager trainings. We tell them, hey, your manager is going to check in with you and share the top three things that they learned. Make sure you ask them what their biggest take takeaway wise, make sure you're checking in on these things, right? You want to make it so that there's, there are multiple points of accountability, not you tell the manager this thing, it dies in a silo and your direct report, meanwhile, your direct reports or your ICs, meanwhile, they have no idea what's going on. They can't ask questions or hold anyone accountable to, which for the record, I want to talk about this, even from like an inclusivity piece and in perspective, think about someone who's first gen professional, who doesn't know what you should or shouldn't hold your manager accountable to, what behaviors are acceptable, which ones are unacceptable. And so meanwhile, their manager never checks in on them and they're thinking, well, that's normal, right? But if you as a company say, no, that's not normal. In fact, these are the standards we hold all managers accountable to. If your manager is not doing this, please chat with them. And if that doesn't work, please reach out for support, right? Not in a punitive way, but like, let's help. How do we manage you? How do we help you manage up, right? I think really, really important is to not forget that piece of things. It's not just about your manager. It's also about at your direct reports because this is a two-way relationship love that um, can i say one thing on that which may be a hot take because some people may think it's a waste of time but one of the pieces of feedback that i got was there were so many individual contributors that wanted some of this manager and leadership training and i know that you know there's this thought of maybe they don't need it maybe it's not for them but for me what it was was like okay people are asking me for this why am i gonna say no it makes no sense to deny them the opportunity to learn. But obviously, let's be thoughtful about how we're going to do this and offer this to people across the business. So what I ended up doing is this year, because there was so much interest, because to Mel's point, the managers were talking about it with their direct reports. The direct reports were like, well, I want to get better at giving feedback, or I want to understand how, like, if I'm going through change, how do I manage better? Or like, how can I be more accountable? So what I did was, you know, I chose a few that I thought would be good for the broader audience. And again, we scheduled two or three, and then the rest are up for discussion as we go through them. We just did our second. And we had like 35 people from across the company that joined because they wanted to learn and they're totally optional. This is not part of like manager training curriculum. This is literally, if you're an employee policy me and you want to join, it is there for you once every two months and you can join whatever topic you want, no pressure. And that ability to also get a little bit of that training for them has been so valuable. And then the managers reach out to me and they say, oh my God, my direct report was like so much more prepared for my one-on-one. -on -one. So it's nice to see it come from both sides as well. Amazing. Thank you. Okay. One last quick question. It sounds like this was going on in the chat as well. So one people, uh, one, one thing that people get challenged with is do, how do you deliver training to managers and team members who have different needs and different skill sets? I, I can provide like a very quick um, thought on this. Um, one is obviously the disclaimer is I think you should um, separate out different groups of managers by seniority level, because from a psychological safety perspective, people are not going to be as open and vulnerable if their own manager is there. And and certainly I think that there are just very different needs and complexities when it comes to like an executive level manager versus a first time manager. But that aside, like let's assume we've accepted that. I would say um, this is actually for me a good thing, not a bad thing, if there are differing needs and skill sets, because what it means is you can leverage your managers to peer coach in those sessions. I think um, what you have to do is be really smart about making sure that you're tapping into that because um, this actually keeps them engaged. People like feeling smart. People like feeling like they have something of value to share. So the people who already know the thing, they're not going to be bored necessarily as long as you can leverage them as peer coaches. And the people who need to learn from them will learn from them. And you sort of switch it around through every training. So I actually think it's not a problem if you have differing needs and skill sets. I do think it's a problem if you have differing seniority levels because that's a different level of complexity. I agree with that. I think we're at time. I don't need to add much more there. Awesome. Well, thank you so, so much. Really appreciate you joining us. Thanks everyone who called in and everything. And um, 
we're here for you. So follow us, um, sign up for a demo, check out the free trial, like anything we can do to help each other out. Like we're all in this together. So appreciate you all. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks all.